I am Pastor Prophet. And as you may or may not know, Sunday evenings, we are studying the book of Revelation. Uh, we are in chapter 5. And we study a little bit differently than some people may study. We study precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, as it says in the book of Isaiah. All right, let us begin. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Okay, <clears throat> who's speaking? John the Revelator is the one that is speaking. Where is he at at this time? He is in the third heaven. Because remember in chapter four, four means dalet, door. It was said, come up hither and I will show you what things are going to happen hereafter. So the Lord has moved John in the spirit and now he is there seeing the kingdom of heaven. And I saw in the, which hand? In the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Okay, here's the trick question though. Who's sitting on the throne? The father. He sees in the right hand of the father. What does he see? A book written. Is it a scroll? No, he specifically describes that it is a book and it is written within and on the backside. Now, a scroll is not written on the backside. You only read one side of a scroll. So he is making a differentiation between a scroll and a book because a book has writing on this page and on the backside of that page. So he clearly sees the book. What's significant about that? What? Where's the book located at? In his right hand. Um. What else is at the right hand of the Father? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Okay, now this book that we see, what is it? It's the Word. The Word, uppercase W, that's Jesus, and lowercase W are both in the right hand of the Father. Let's take a look at a couple precepts. Give me Psalms chapter 16, verse 11. 16, 11. The right hand is very significant. Psalm 16, 11, the Bible says, Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Hmm. Okay, so he's going to show me the path of life. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jesus said, I am the, the, and the, okay, so he shew me the path. He, he shows me the direction that I need to walk in. I need to walk like Jesus walked. He came to be an example of how I should walk. Okay? So he showed me the path of life. And then he called me into his presence. Did you guys know that's what joy means? The word joy means to be in the presence of God. Don't let nobody steal your joy. What does that mean? Don't let nobody take you out of the presence of God. People will try to do that all the time. You make sure that you are re remaining in the presence of God. And it says, at thy right hand, boom, there's a book in his right hand. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Let's talk more about the right hand. Give me Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Let's find out. So we, we found out in Revelation that there's a book in the right hand. But Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory, that's Jesus, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the what? Word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do? Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So now the scripture has told us that the uppercase W, that's Jesus, he's the word, he's on the right hand of the Father. But there's also the lowercase w at the right hand of the Father. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who think that the, 
lowercase w, word of God, is spread out amongst hundreds of different books, right? They're like ESV and AMSB, and I'm just making up letters. I'd be like BET and EBT, no matter what, all kinds of initials. They think the word of God is contained in all of those. Did it say that, that in his right hand there were books? It said there was one book. Okay, did you guys know that there's only one Bible that's authorized? The rest are not authorized versions. There's only one that's authorized. That means authority was given to a man to produce that version of the Bible. Well, that just happens to be the King James Bible. So do we, do we think like if you're, if you're picturing this, you got the father sitting there and you think he has like a message Bible in his right hand <laughs> and he's just flipping through there and he gets to Isaiah where it literally says blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Can you imagine the father? Re it says blah, blah, blah. And that's not the book that he has at his right hand, is it? Okay, probably not. Give me Exodus chapter 15, verse 6. Exodus chapter 15, verse 6. They started talking about what's at the right hand of the Father all the way back in Exodus. Look, it says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan is the enemy. How are you going to defeat him? you got to speak the word of God. Isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus spoke the word of God. Okay, but what if you're, you're speaking something that Sounds like the word of God, but it's not the word of God. Does it still have the power of God? No, it does not. It's a counterfeit. Okay, check this out. Back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. Let's see a little bit more about Jesus at the right hand of God. Hebrews 1, verse 13. The Bible says, but to which of the angels said he at any time? This is the Father. To which of the angels did the Father ever say, Sit thou, I'm sorry, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? He never said that to Michael. He didn't say that to Gabriel. He didn't say that to any of the angels. Who did he say that to? He said that to Jesus. When did he say it? Watch this. This will blow your mind. Give me Psalms chapter 110. Let's take a look at verse 1. Psalms 110. Jesus had not even come in the flesh the first time, and God had already made this promise to him. This is the power and strength of prophecy. Now, when you're reading this, I want to show you something very important that you will only find in this version of the Bible. If you have a different version of the Bible, it will not say that. And if it does say that, it will not be spelled that way. So let me show you. This first word, the Lord, see how it's all capitals? That's called superscript. The name that was placed there is the actual name of the Father, Yahweh. Okay. The Lord, that's the Father, said unto my Lord, is that one all capitals? That's lowercase. Okay, so this one is actually Adonai. That's how you say Lord in Hebrew. Okay, now watch it. It says, the Lord said unto my Lord. Who wrote the book of Psalms? Okay, now David is saying, The Father said unto the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou, where is he sitting at? At my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, David, he got to hear a little bit of the conversation in, in, in the Spirit before it was ever spoken what we read in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> take me back to take me back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. We're still in verse 1. Sometimes we get off on a tangent. We have to understand. You guys know that there's not a single word wasted in the Bible? Every single one of these words means something. And if you start to pick up on them, God will reveal mysteries to you. Okay? And I saw... In the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside. Let's pause right there. See how there's uh, punctuation? We're going to pause at the punctuation and make sure that we understand it. This book was written within and on the backside. Now, John is seeing a vision that someone else also saw. Remember how I tell you guys all the prophets saw the same thing? Give me Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. 
Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Because before John the Revelator saw this, Ezekiel saw it. Watch this, it says, And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. Now he's very specific. Is it a book? It's a roll of a book. Because in the days of Ezekiel, did they have pages that flipped like this? They had scrolls. Okay, let's keep going. Let's find out a little bit more. Because he's not seeing in his own time. He's seeing prophetically into the future. It says, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. Did he see a scroll? No. He saw a book. What is he looking at? He's looking at the book that's in the right hand of the Father. And there was written therein, watch what he says is written inside of it. Lamentation, you know what that word means? Lamentation. Weeping, crying, terrible things. To lament is to be very sorrowful. He says there was written therein lamentations and mourning. You guys know what mourning means, right? Not like you woke up this morning, but to be very sorrowful. And woe. Is that woe like you're riding a horse and you tell it to slow down? What kind of woe is that? That woe, W-O-E. Have you guys ever heard like you've been watching Tom and Jerry and they're like, woe is me. You guys, they don't know Tom and Jerry. That's weird. Tom and Jerry, did I just tell them how old I was? <laughs> they're like, Tom and who? They would never speak, but they would say, woe is me. That means I am destroyed. I am completely distraught. Now, Ezekiel sees the same book that John the Revelator saw. He sees that it's a book. It's not a scroll. It's written on the front side and on the back side. But he gets to look in a little bit and he sees, whoo, man, that scroll right there is no joke. There is a whole lot of weeping and destruction in that scroll. Okay, let's see a little bit more because you guys know God does things in cycles. You guys remember um, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation was told to take the book out of the angel's hand. And what was he told to do? He was told to eat that book. God always does things in cycles. Watch this. Give me Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 1. This is the same book. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. <laughs> that sounds like he got a nice little buttered roll. No, it's not that. He's talking about eating the book. <laughs> Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. He tells him to eat the book. How do you eat a book? How do you eat a book? You read it. You read it. You're feasting on the bread with your eyes. And then what does he tell him to do after you have you got that bread inside of you. I want you to go speak unto the house of Israel. Share the bread with them. Okay, watch. Give me, give me verse 2. So I opened my, out, my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Keep going. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it. Look at how it tastes. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So it's sweet in his mouth, but it's bitter in his belly. One more verse, verse four. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. So God revealed a prophecy to Ezekiel and he told him to Get it inside of him. Isn't that what God tells you to do with his word? Let this word be inside of you. Consume it. Feast on it. And then you go and you share it with other people. All right. Back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. This is interesting. It says, John saw the same thing that Ezekiel saw. Isaiah saw it also. In fact, all of the prophets saw the same thing. God didn't give them different visions. They wrote about different areas of their vision. They all saw the same thing. I can prove it. It's simple. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all saw the same thing. They just wrote about it in their own way. 
and all the books of the Bible are exactly that way. That's the reason why it feels like you're reading the same thing over and over again. Okay, so in the right hand of him, in the right hand of the Father is a book, and it's actually a book. It's not a scroll. It's written within and on the backside. But there's something interesting about it. What is it? What's the last line say? It's sealed with seven seals. Isaiah 29, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 29. Let's find out how and why it is sealed. Isaiah chapter 29. Verse 10, the Bible says, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Who covered them? The Lord did that. Okay, now watch this. Give me verse 11. It says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is what? Sealed. What's in the right hand of the guy sitting next to the, what, what's there? There's a book. And what is it? It's sealed. Okay. So the, the vision has become unto you as the words of a book that are sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. What does that mean? Can, can I look in it? No, it's sealed. It's closed to me. Okay. Now, let's, let's keep reading just a little bit more. Watch this. <clears throat> And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. This book, if God does not reveal it to you, you can run your eyes over it all you want. But in your own strength and in your own power, you cannot understand it. The Lord has to reveal. That's the reason why the book is called what? Revelation. <laughs> it's the book of Revelation. If the Lord has not revealed it to you, you're just reading it, and it might as well be a comic book. You're like, man, there's fire, there's brimstone, there's superheroes, and there's... But none of it means anything to you. Okay? So we, we want to know so badly. We say, here, read this. And he says, ooh, uh, I can't. It's sealed. What does that mean? I can't even get it open. And then you take the book from him, give me that book, man, let me, and you give it to somebody else. You say, read this. I really need to know what this says. And he says, I can open it. It's not sealed to me, but I am not learned to understand what it means. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Let's find out when the book was sealed. See, we're still in verse one of Revelation. We're finding out so much about this book because this book is very important. You guys know what he's going to do with this book? He's going to judge the nations out of this book. He doesn't have some surprise book that when you get to see him, he's going to say, ha, ha, boom, and pull out some, some rules that you never heard of and be like, you don't get to go to heaven because you didn't read this book. He's not going to do that. He's going to pull out a book, and he's going to say, see that right there? Remember that? The dusty one that you have in the back of your car that you drove all around the city with, but you never took the time to read it? Let's open it up and see what your life was like. Okay? We're going to open that book, and then hopefully Jesus is going to stand up in the courtroom and say, hey, his name is written in me, <laughs> and then you get off the hook. If your name is not written in Jesus, you will be judged out of this book. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Because the scripture clearly said that in Revelation, the book was sealed. Let's see how it got sealed. Now, we proved that Ezekiel saw the same thing. We know that Isaiah saw the same thing. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Daniel saw the exact same thing. And reading the book of Daniel is like reading the book of Revelation, but in the Old Testament. Now, after Daniel sees all of these things, he starts asking questions. He's like, what is this? And when is that going to happen? And what about this? And the Lord says this to him. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and do what? Now we know how the book got sealed. Yeah, seal the book, Daniel. Daniel saw everything. Daniel saw all the way to the lake of fire. Man, seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. That to and fro sounds interesting, don't it? Who runs to and fro? Angels run to and fro. Men don't run to and fro. This is a phrase that is reserved for angels to run to and fro. Remember, 
There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who came also? Satan came also, and God said, Satan, where you come from? And what did Satan say? From to and, walking to and fro in the earth, up and down in it. That phrase is reserved throughout the entire Bible for angels. We're going to see that again a little bit later. Okay, now, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Notice that it does not say wisdom shall be increased. <laughs> There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Yeah, wisdom is a holy thing, but it's possible for you to have knowledge of the unholy. And that's what our kids are developing nowadays. They are wise to do evil. They know how to do evil that we didn't know how to do when we were kids. It's crazy. Okay, so now we see how this book got sealed. Give me Revelation 22, verse 10. Let's see when it gets unsealed. Revelation 22, 10, watch this. Now this is the very last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22. And God is still speaking to John the Revelator. And John the Revelator has now seen the whole vision that Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, he saw the same vision. And watch what he says to him. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So now it is possible during these last days for us to use precept upon precept to know what the Bible is actually talking about. If you are still reading this book like it's a comic book, you're just like, I think I'm going to start in Genesis and work my way to Revelation, then you have not yet hit the portion of the Bible where it tells you how to read it. You're still reading it like a child reads a book. Children have a hard time dealing with puzzles. You're gonna, like, um, like um, when it's a word puzzle, and literally that's what it is, it's a word puzzle, they have a hard time dealing with these word puzzles. Now, for us, not only is it a word puzzle, but it's also a cross word puzzle. See, see what I did there? That was real clever. That was real clever. They don't know, they don't know. It's a cross word puzzle. The average child is not gonna look at that and be like, oh, this looks like fun. It's for us that are a little bit older. Right? Oh, I got a little extra time. You pick up the newspaper. Do they even make newspapers anymore? It used to be in there, and you would pick it up, and you would fill out that crossword puzzle. Well, now, guess what? When you have a little extra time, I want you to pick up your Bible and fill out this crossword puzzle. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little, and there a little. Why? For the time is at hand. All right. Take me back to Revelation chapter 5. We are now in verse 2. <laughs> and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. This angel must have been buff. He probably looked like the rock. Because how you know he's strong just by looking at it? He must have had mad muscles. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. What is he saying? Who is worthy to open the book? and to loose the seals thereof. Let's keep going, verse three. That, that part's pretty clear. An angel, he's in heaven, he says, somebody need to get this book open. Verse three is gonna require some explanation. The Bible says, and no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Okay, let's break it down. First line. No man in heaven. Are there men in heaven now? Are there men? In, how come everybody's looking confused? Are there men in heaven now? No. What? Remember, John is seeing a prophecy. Okay, he's seeing a prophecy. And no man in heaven. Well, let me just deal with that real quick. Give me John chapter 3 verse 13. John chapter 3, verse 13, then we're going to come right back here. At the time that John, that John the Revelator is seeing this, there are 24 men in heaven. Right now, are there any men in heaven? I know a lot of us, when our family members die, we'd be like, they're with the Lord in heaven now, but that's not what the Bible says. Yeah, that, that's, that's confusion because that would mean that they went to heaven without being judged. If you can go to heaven without being judged, what is Jesus coming back for? It clearly says he's coming back to judge the quick and the dead. Okay, so let's see what Jesus himself said. Um, 
John chapter 3, verse 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven. Is there anybody in heaven now? Because the scripture says no man hath ascended up to heaven. Well, there is one. But he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, and watch what he says here. This is crazy. Which is in heaven. Wait, what? See, in heaven there is no time. Remember how I tell you guys that? So when Jesus speaks about the kingdom of heaven, he has to reconcile the space-time continuum by explaining nobody ever went up there except for me. I came down from there, but guess where I am? I am still there because I've always been there. So he's in two places at once. That's what eternity is. I, sometimes I explain this, and I'm not sure you guys get it. The people that are in the lake of fire are already in the lake of fire. The people that are with Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, do you know we are already there? Because there's no time in heaven. What we are experiencing down here is, for lack of a better explanation, it's a simulation. Because eternity does not have a beginning. And if he said you're going to have eternal life, and you said, well, when does that start? It wouldn't be eternal life if it had a start or if it had an end. It's always that way. This is how he's able to speak of being on the heaven, on the earth, and in heaven at the same time. Okay, so he explains right there that no man ascended up into heaven. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 3. It says, and no man in heaven... But at this time, there are 24 men in heaven. Who are they? The elders, the prophets, and the disciples. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth. What's under the earth? Well, that's where everybody goes when they die. You go under some dirt. <laughs> uh, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So they're not able to open the book. Let me just show you guys a scripture real quick because a lot of people struggle with that one thing. They struggle with the idea that their family members are not in heaven. They will agree with everything that we teach from this Bible until we say aunt or uncle so-and-so is not smiling down on you from heaven. Then they're like, oh, I, that, I gotta leave that church. Let me just show you something real quick. Give me Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 20. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 20. Watch this. The Bible says, all go to one place. All are of the dust and all. Does it say some? All turn to dust again. <laughs> but do we think that dust is in heaven? No, you go into the earth. Give me verse 21. The Bible talks about this continually, but this is a deception. Satan wants you to believe that the minute you die, you go to heaven without a judgment. Well, if there's no judgment, then you might as well do whatever you want. If you're going to die and boom, a split second later, you're going to be with God in heaven. Jesus is not coming back. He wants you to believe Jesus is not coming back to judge. Okay. The Bible says, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? Where does the spirit of man go? Upward. And the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Amen. I got another one just, just came to me real quick. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5. The Bible says, for the living, what do they know? What does it say? For the living know that they shall die, but the dead, what do they know? They don't know nothing. <laughs> Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Verse 6. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Where do they go? They go to the grave when they die. And what happens when Christ comes back? The scripture clearly says, who's going to rise first? The dead are going to, that's going to be very hard for you to be rising up out of the grave if you think you already in heaven. That doesn't make any sense. Take me back to Revelation. I got off on a tangent for a second. 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 3. It says, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now that sounds like the exact example that we saw in Isaiah when he delivered the book to the one who is learned, and he says, it's sealed. And then you deliver it to the one who's not learned, and he says, it's not sealed, but I'm not learned how to read it. You can't open it, and you can't look at the words. Give me verse 4. This is John speaking. He says, and I wept much. He just started crying. You got to imagine that you're, you're there, right? You're, you're there standing next to John, and you see this strong angel, and he asks a question. Who's worthy? Who's worthy to look at the word of God? And then there is a dead silence throughout heaven and earth because no one can respond. No one is worthy. And, and you're like, wait a minute. If this book is sealed and I need to get it open, then he just starts crying. He starts bawling. It says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse 5. This is where things start to change around. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. He said, why are you crying? Don't you know we win? Why are you crying? Look, weep not. Behold the what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. That's a title. The root of David. That's a title. Hath prevailed. What does that word prevail mean? I mean, he overcame. And what does he expect you to do? Oh, see, so he doesn't expect you to do something that he didn't do he overcame and now he wants you to overcome look he hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof who watch this this was prophesied all the way back in the book of genesis what did what did the angel call him or the, the elder called him the lion of the tribe of judah and he called him the root of david give me genesis chapter 49 Let's see a prophecy. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. Genesis 40. Genesis is all the way back in the beginning, but you know God being the author and finisher of our faith, he knew the end from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8, it says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Judah in Hebrew means the Lord is my praise. Judah, Yahawadah. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. <laughs> I think that's funny right there. He's you choking them out. What, come on, that's what it is. He's, he's choking out his enemies. Come on, look. <laughs> Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Now this is, um, this is Jacob. Come on, hold on. No, hold on. Um, give me verse one real quick so I can show you guys who's talking, and then I'll address that. Genesis 49, 1. And Jacob called unto his sons. His sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. And said, gather yourselves together that I might tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. All the way in Genesis chapter 49, he was already prophesying of what was going to take place in the book of Revelation. He said, everybody get together. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Thousands upon thousands of years from now. And then he begins to speak to all of his sons. Now, Joseph is one of his sons. Okay? But here he's speaking to Judah. Now, give me verse 9. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. What's a lion's whelp? Nobody knows. It's a young lion. A lion's whelp is a young lion. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son. What did he call him? My son. The prophecy is in there. He was already calling Judah his son. Okay, now watch. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? Verse 10. The prophecy starts to get a little more clear right here in verse 10. The scepter, what's a scepter? A scepter is the thing that you see a king have in his hand. It's a small stick, and it represents his authority. 
The Bible says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Anybody know who Shiloh is? Shiloh is Jesus. He was prophesied all the way back in the book of Genesis. It says, and unto him shall be the gathering, shall the gathering of the people be. The people will be gathered unto Jesus. Now watch. Verse 11. We got to go a little farther. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. That's a reference to when Jesus made his triumphant, triumphant entry into Jerusalem for the Passover. Remember, he told his disciples, hey, go down there and get me a colt. And what he came riding in on an ass, right? It was prophesied all the way back in Genesis that he would do that. Now watch this. Jacob is given a, a, a crazy prophecy right here. It says, he washed his garments in wine. What color are his clothes if they're washed in wine? They're red. Why are they red? Because he's going to tread the wine press like it says in Isaiah and like it said in Revelation. Let's keep going and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Watch verse 12. That's a description of Jesus. What color are Jesus' eyes in Revelation? They're red, right? Bible. We didn't know that until we read the very last book of the Bible. We're like, wait a minute, that's amazing. Take me back to Revelation chapter five, verse five. Let's see why we went there. The Bible says, and one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion. Isn't that what he was called in Genesis? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Wait, give me um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Hold that revelation. We're coming right back there in a split second. I just need to make sure that you guys understand who the lion from the tribe of Judah is. The Bible says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of what? Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Okay? Um, taking back to Revelation 5, verse 5. So here we see he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. What is his other title? The root of David. Who's David? Who's David? David is, David is the king. Okay? He's the root of of David. Okay, give me Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Through thy precepts, what do I get? Understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Okay, now watch this. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, Who's Jesse? That's David's father. Okay, the root of David is Jesse. Does that make sense? Okay, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch, capital B. We're gonna, we're gonna see this a couple times in verse two. I think I've told you guys about this. How many, how many are the spirits of God? There are seven spirits of God and they're only located right here in this verse. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There, those are the seven spirits. Whew. Okay, back to Revelation chapter 5. Now we know why he's called the root of David, because he sprang forth out of Jesse. It says, he hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. See what I did there? I showed you the seven spirits before we went to it so that now you will know when he's talking about these seven spirits, Jesus has these seven spirits. Okay, now let's run it back to the top. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, what are these beasts? We talked about them all last week. What are they? Four angels, they're the four beasts, they're cherubim or seraphim because they have six wings, right? Boom. How many faces do they have? What are their faces? They have four faces. There's one here, one back there, and on the sides. Okay, what do their faces look like? Who remembers? Which are the seven spirits? The spirits 
are angels. The seven spirits of God are seven angels of God. They're full of eyes and they were sent forth into all the earth. Let's get into some of this. Ooh, we already took a look at the seven spirits, right? Let's see it one more time. Give me Isaiah chapter 11, verse two. I want you to see this one more time because the Bible makes reference to the seven spirits of God numerous times. Okay, let's make sure we got them all. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven spirits of God. Okay. Let's talk about this lamb for a second. Give me Isaiah 53 verse 7. Isaiah 53 verse 7. Tells you about Jesus. And he, it says, he was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb so he openeth not his mouth that was a prophecy that when they were questioning Jesus about everything that he said did he answer and he say nothing he just stood there and looked at him like they was crazy right that's what we need to do sometimes when people are asking us for the second and third time as if our first answer was not good enough <laughs> I'm just gonna look at you like you're crazy but well, you want me to repeat myself no, you want me to change what I've said. I've already said it. Now you're asking me again because you want me to change what I've said. I'm just going to look at you like a lamb. Okay, now watch this. Um, John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. This is the story of when John the Baptist sees Jesus the Christ for the first time. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, what does he say? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What did he just call him? The Lamb of God. But not just any old lamb. He's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So now we got to go back a little bit farther because how does a lamb take away the sin? Huh, okay. Give me 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. I need to find out how a lamb is going to take away the sin. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it's, it was the blood of the lamb that took away the sin. Isn't that right? Okay, it's the blood of Jesus that redeems us to the to the Father. Now look at verse 20 right here. It's going to tell you, you got to go back farther. It says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The scripture just said that the lamb was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. Oh man, I got to go back a little bit farther. Let me... I remember a story about um, some lamp. What? Give me Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. Let's confirm that. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who? That's the beast whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When was the lamb slain? A lot of times we think he was slain on the cross, right, in 30 AD. They, we think that's when the lamb was slain. No, he was slain from the foundation of the world. Let me show you a time previous when the lamb was slain for us. Give me Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. The lamb is such a powerful character in the scriptures. Take a look. The Bible says, this month shall be, un shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Give me the next verse. Verse 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a what? A lamb, according to the house of their fathers. A lamb 
for a house. What is this? What is this? This is the story of the Passover. The blood of the lamb was slain all the way back then. Give me verse five real quick. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. One more verse, verse six. Ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. That's exactly what happened to Jesus, right? Because he's the lamb and he shed. This is the first one that I could think of at first. And then I was like, I remember two people walking around in a garden and they sinned. And what is the wages of sin? Death. And if you don't die, then something has to die in your place. Watch this. You got to see this. Give me Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Genesis chapter 3. Now, we would say Genesis, that's the foundation of the world, right? <laughs> that's the very beginning. Okay. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, they have just committed their sin. Give me the next verse. Let's see what God does to have them atone for their sins. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Anybody see it? Where do you think those, where do you think those clothes came from? That was a lamb skin because he slaughtered the lamb from the foundation of the world to atone for Adam and Eve's sin. But he clothed them with the lamb's skin. That put them in Jesus. Aren't you supposed to be in Jesus? Man, but Jesus is supposed to be in you at the same time. Now, this is the mystery. When the Bible talks about the mystery that most people don't understand, this is it. I'm growing in Christ, and Christ is growing in me at the exact same time. That is the mystery in the scriptures. So now we have a better understanding of when the Bible talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. We know it's always been Jesus. Amen. Anybody get goose bun, little goose pimples rising up? You're like, wait a minute. From the very beginning, we went all the way back. You, you, can't, you can't have life without he that said, I am life, right? They would have died on the spot if God did not do that, right? Because the wages of sin is death. That, a lot of times in our church, we talk in pictures and teachings, and there's always a picture to accompany the teaching. So that was the picture that happened in the very first book of the Bible. That's the picture so that we would be able to understand when we saw Jesus, the lamb, being slain for all of us. Okay, let me see. Take me back to Revelation. I think there's a couple more pieces in there that we got to take a look at real quick. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. Okay, so the lamb is standing in the middle of the throne having seven horns and seven eyes. Seven eyes? Why has he got seven eyes? Um, give me Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Zechariah, let's find out what these eyes are. Zechariah chapter 3, I'm getting to it. Okay, this is going to sound familiar. Watch this, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wandered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant. What's his servant's name? The branch. Who is that? That's Jesus. Okay, now watch this. Verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be... What's there? Seven eyes. We just read about seven eyes in Revelation. Now we're finding out that Jesus rolls with something that has seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Okay, seven eyes, huh? Give me same book, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 4, 
verse 10. Watch this. Got to watch this one carefully. It's, it's hidden in here. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Okay, let me break it down. Zerubbabel is to build the second temple. That's an actual man. We have not despised the day of small beginnings. That's where that, that people say that don't despise small beginnings. It doesn't actually say that in the Bible. It says exactly this. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice. That's the children of Israel shall rejoice and they shall see the plummet. The plummet is a tool that is used in building. In the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. What seven? They are the eyes of the Lord. So these seven, what are they? They're the eyes of the Lord. What do they do? Which run to and fro through the whole earth. We talked about that earlier. That saying to and fro is reserved for who? Angels. Now, you guys remember, because we just read Revelation, what did he do? He wrote a letter to seven angels. Those seven angels are the eyes of the Lord. They're the seven angels of the seven churches. Lamps. What are the seven lamps? They are the spirits of God. They are the church of God. Does that make sense? We got one last verse. I'm calling the worship team after this. Take me back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, and he... Who's he? The lamb. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So the lamb was the only one that was worthy to open the book, to take the book, to read the book. He's the only one. Why is that? Because he is the word of God. Nobody knows the word like the word. What you got? So, in the Bible, um, the H on he or his is never uppercase. We do that in our modern rendering. Like if you're talking about God, uh, we would be like, God said this, he did that. We would capitalize the he, but in the Bible, it's never capitalized. Yeah. All right, so check this out. It says, what did the lamb do? He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. This book... This, this book, this book is a witness of your entire life. Imagine angels are standing next to you, writing down everything you say and writing down everything you do. When you think nobody is watching, they're saying, let's see if you're a Christian now when no eyes are on you, right? That's, that's this is a book of your whole life. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 31. Verse 24, Deuteronomy 31, 24. Moses talked about this book. Deuteronomy 31, 24 says, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law. What did he write them in? It doesn't say a scroll, does it? That's weird because they had scrolls back then. Why does it say a book? That's not a typo. That's not an error. We don't read scrolls. We read books. Why? Because we're in the last days. And he told you, hey, I'm going to put this here so that you will know what's going to happen in the last days. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. You guys got to see this. This is so magnificent. Jesus is on the cross. He's hanging there and he's looking up. And what does he say? It is finished. That means the prophecy concerning him is finished. And the Bible says, and then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Okay, that's very interesting because Moses was writing the word and Jesus is the word. Okay, the word of this law and Jesus is the law and he put it in a book. <laughs> this, that book right here until it was finished. Should I be going out looking for extra books? Do I need more books? I don't need more books. 
Solomon told me of making many books, there is no end. But I tell you what, fear the Lord and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of a man. I don't need more books. I got enough books right here. Watch, give me the next verse. Verse 25. After Moses spoke all of this until it was finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, last verse, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant. Where do you put the book? What's in the main part of the ark of the covenant? The two tables of the Ten Commandments. So right here we have the law and we have the testimony in one place. It says, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there. It's there for a specific reason. What is it there for? It's there for a witness. So what happens? Wh wh where do you find a witness at? You find a witness wherever there is a judge. God is the righteous judge, and on that day, he's going to say, I'd like to call my first witness, and he's going to pull out a book, and he's going to be like, um, it appears that you broke penal code Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. Clearly, you were, and, and so he's going to point out just like that. Amen? Now, let me show you the flip side of that. You better hope that you are represented by the greatest attorney that there is. That's Jesus. Jesus is there in the courtroom and he's sitting off to the side and he's got a big old book and the book don't have nothing but names in it. And it just has all the names of the people that represented him, that confessed him, that did not deny him. And he just flips, he's like, okay, Patrick, um, I'm representing Patrick and we plead no contest. I'm representing him. And the judge says, oh, you got this one, Jesus? Patrick, you go on into the kingdom. God forbid you step up before the judge and you didn't believe in Jesus, but those people had been telling you about it the whole time, telling you you got to keep the law, the testimony, you got to keep the commandments, and you're standing there, and God pulls out the book of the law, and he says, you broke all 614 laws and you just standing there like my attorney <laughs> and you're looking around and nobody's there to represent you because you did not represent anybody in your life that's what he means when he says if you confess me before man i will confess you before my father that means i'm gonna stand up for you right but if you deny me before men i will also deny you before my father amen this is the message that i have for you guys tonight Ooh.